So I'd like to welcome you to the co-designing a new and better global systems accounting. Um, this is, we're, we're so glad you're able to join us today as we explore this question of how do we create an accounting system that actually measures well-being instead of just money. And today we're fortunate to have Arthur Dahl with us, who, who is the one who instigated this whole inquiry into an alternative accounting for global systems. I should probably say that it was after COP26 in Glasgow where we had an intensive on looking at the challenges of climate change and all the other existential threats that you know, are, are facing us. And I was trying to think well, after working for more than 50 years and trying to build solutions, why are we still at the same place today and still going in the wrong direction? And what was really wrong with the system and how might you address that at the most fundamental level? And uh, Part of that thinking over a couple of relatively sleepless nights was that really it's our economic paradigm that calculates everything in terms of money, monetary profit and loss, and capital and interest, and return on investment, and theoretical efficiency of the market, aiming for GDP growth. And that's been the paradigm for several decades now, and has driven many of the problems we see, the environmental problems, the energy system, and the social problems as well. Uh, and therefore I thought, well, you know, having worked for many decades also in questions of indicators, how might you rethink the indicators are to replace the financial system entirely? I think we can't simply say abolish or change the financial system without proposing something better to go in its place. So this is sort of an early attempt to say, what might you do to design another kind of accounting system that actually would be giving us you know, the right measures with respect to human societal and environmental well-being? So this is only you might say a thought piece to stimulate reflection and discussion uh, in a system perspective, a beginning of what I hope will be a, a process to take these ideas, run with them, take them further, provide some initial thinking about what I saw as you might say the minimum of what that system might look like. And then you can form you know, discussion groups to take the particular ideas forward. If one or another of those themes is one that you really resonates with you and you have expertise in and say, this is something you'd like to explore and, and take further looking at global system accounting beyond economics. How do you rethink accounting using other than monetary currencies? Because you're know, putting things in terms of money, everybody complains, well, that's you know, is make, just emphasizing the monetary side of things. But if we look at the basic principles of accounting, you know, capital is a standing stock of a resource. Interest is extracting wealth from the capital. Debt is borrowing the capital. It's normally reimbursed with some kind of interest. So there's sort of, basic ways of which you handle you know, things in accounting. But our present financial system looks at monetary profit over all the benefits. Uh, and we have stock markets that are valued in terms of return on investment. Uh, and the whole aim of the banking of the corporations is to generate more and more profit. And we have sort of seen an economy in which the central banks have pumped enormous quantities of money into the system to keep it going with inflated government debt, stock market highs at the same time. So the governments get more in debt and the stock market goes, goes higher and higher. So is this really the direction you know, that we need to be going in? We see wealth generating wealth, so rich get richer. Uh, but this giant debt bubble is sort of rolled over with borrowing, but who can imagine all of that being repaid someday and eliminating all debt? Uh, even development aid is largely as loans. And we have a neo colonial economic system, which removes wealth uh, from the developing countries. There's, there's always a net flow away from developing countries to rich countries, and developing countries are trapped in, in debt servicing. If we look at the values and principles for a new kind of a system, uh, we might start by saying, well, we're all one human family with rights and obligations as members of the human race. We have principles of justice, of leaving no one behind, as the United Nations has said with the 2030 Agenda and the sustainable development goals. We all should have the right to necessities of life, enough food to eat, water to drink, shelter, uh, and we should be able to develop our capacity to contribute to human well-being and social advancement as every single human being on the planet, which is not true for at least half the world population at the present time. So we also have a responsibility for care and management of our natural world. We're living within we're living with planetary boundaries, which are already exceeding in certain areas like climate change and nitrogen and phosphorus and, and biodiversity and so on. And therefore, we have to look at moderating our material civilization, which is driven by the present economic system. 
and at the same time restoring the damage we're doing to the natural world, regenerating nature. We have the sustainable development goals, which give us the kind of a, a general mode, except for uh, all countries, for where we should be going towards a more sustainable society. But we also have a lot of capacity for science, for art, and for culture. We need to develop more respect for the truth at a time when it's becoming less and less important in the way the media are manipulating us. We're building more trust and trustworthiness. And we have this responsibility to en enrich, preserve, and transmit this heritage of knowledge and learning from generation to generation. We might say ultimately our, higher, our permanent purpose is essentially spiritual, acquiring our values. So within this set of frameworks, what kind of a new accounting system might be designed that would respond to, to those values and help to define them? So what, what would be the new forms of capital and the relevant currencies to take this kind of accounting system forward? So looking at alternative accounting, I thought well, we might have some environmental accounts looking at carbon and biodiversity and pollution, for instance, some social economic accounts like a minimum you know, living, living wage, eliminate poverty. We need certain accounts for knowledge and education and maybe some kind of spiritual accounts. And we sort of have an expert present here who can take us further on that particular dimension. So looking at, say, carbon accounting. A carbon price, which we're now, will put a price on carbon that's still monetary. What we need is to accounting with carbon as the currency. In the early life on this planet, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, early life removed the excess carbon from the atmosphere and brought the temperature down to make it suitable for animal life. And then we have we had a carbon budget imbalance with animals producing carbon dioxide and plants absorbing it, uh, generating oxygen for the animals and so on. So that was a reasonably balanced until we started extracting fossil fuels as carbon had been stored hundreds of millions of years ago, upsetting that balance. And now the carbon concentration in the atmosphere is at a dangerous level. So that's one side, you might say, of, of the carbon accounts. At the same time, I'd say that the biomass, organic carbon in the soil and so on, is carbon capital. That's where the carbon should be. Uh, plants maintain that capital and the ecosystem services they provide. The excess atmospheric carbon is carbon debt, which is what has been in this, this global heating. So we're living beyond our means in carbon at the present time, producing more and more carbon debt rather than bringing it back into balance. While those countries that have biological resources have carbon storage capital that needs regeneration. And so if we want to complete the carbon economy, we shall be, how do we encourage and, and provide the benefits of that service you know, to our community? So destroying biological resources, releasing fossil carbon increases carbon debt. That wealth from fossil energy should be taxed because it's generated, that could there be used to reward carbon removal from the atmosphere. And as long as atmospheric carbon is in your harm, that's like the, uh, an annual tax on historic emissions, like paying interest on the debt. You know, at the present time, you, know, you release it once and you can forget about it. But if you borrowed something, if you keep paying interest on your debt until you reimburse it. So logically, for the historic emissions should keep paying for that carbon until they find ways to remove it from the atmosphere. So payments for carbon circulation could transfer wealth to developing countries. You know, about the inequalities in the world today. This would be one way of bringing that back into balance. And often you hear people say, well, you caused the problem. You've gotten wealthy on the fossil fuels, and now you expect it to, to cut back our, our development in order to respond to the problem, which is unjust. So total carbon accounting would quantify national responsibilities, and some of that would be passed on to the private sector and civil society with positive and negative incentives. So private sector companies that have been generating, you know, re releasing carbon for, for decades should now be expected to pay for the damage they've been done. Whereas parts of civil society, indigenous peoples who've been protecting the capacity to absorb for, de for generations should be receiving positive benefits. And of course, the countries with the highest per capita fossil energy use would pay the most, which would seem to be just in the present circumstances. And the funds that are raised could support mitigation and adaptation in poor countries, because the big problem with the, with the negotiations in, in Glasgow were that the wealthy countries weren't able, willing to come up with the money necessary to, to pay the poor countries for the damage they're having to, come to, to deal with that they didn't cause. And so ultimately, I say that you from a convention on climate change and the article 
you know, IPCC could evolve into the global central bank for carbon accounts. They do a lot of the data collection now, and they could evolve to become the part of the system be responsible for carbon accounting. So one example of a, a, an alternative account that could help us to address one of our key challenges or problems. Look at biodiversity accounting. Oh, the natural systems and their species are biodiversity capital. Reducing biodiversity increases death. Species extinctions are bankruptcies. So accounts based on biological inventories and measures of ecosystem services like oxygen production, carbon sequestration, ecological balance, and remote sensing could give us the data to provide those accounts. And therefore, a biodiversity capital stock and its changes would be based on objective science. The loss of biodiversity as a deforestation should be taxed, which it isn't at present. It's causing global damage and nobody is paying for it. Revenues would support biodiversity conservation and restoration. And the creation of biological diversity and the conservation conventions, the advisory bodies were responsible for accounting for the biodiversity accounts. The same thing can be done for pollution accounting. Global clean environment is a capital we maintain on this planet. Pollution raises are increasing pollution debt. And the capacity of the environment to clean up some of that pollution is a kind of wealth generation whereas persistent pollutants are a debt burden, which would require interest payments as long as those, those bur that burden is out there because they're continuing to cause damage. So the quantification of pollution debts also allows us to implement the polluter pays principle, which has been accepted internationally, but has not really been put into practice because too often polluters can sort of free ride and get away from paying for the damage they're causing. We might start with initial accounts for say, persistent organic pollutants and mercury, yeah, where there already are conventions that are in place dealing with those, uh, plastics, which are you know, being called for a new convention, nitrogen and phosphorus, which are exceeding planetary boundaries. So just a selected set of pollutants that was sort of so as indicators for the whole area of pollution and pollution accounts. <clears throat> and taxes on releases would help to finance their cleanup. <clears throat> UNEP and Red Accounts Conventions could become the global environment agency to manage those pollution accounts. And the overall biosphere accounting could also be done to look at bringing in carbon and biodiversity for the health of the whole planet's natural system and life support services. We need that overall perspective as well as part of the accounting. <clears throat> On the social side, you know, looking at you know, minimum living standards or getting rid of poverty, the social capital you might say is that every human being having a guaranteed minimum income to meet their basic needs, so that nobody is poor, that there'd be a, there a universal social, social safety net without any conditions like his nationality or handicap migration status. Everybody in this country should be entitled to have their basic needs met. And the poverty statistics already measure the debt side of those accounts. We know pretty well who is poor. What we don't have is an adequate measure of individual wealth, which often escapes from national control or is hidden in, in corporate structures or so on. There's a lot of you know, tax havens and so on. So we need a better estimate of where the wealth is going in order to you know, be, might say, be able to bring things back into balance. But then graduated income and wealth taxes would transfer the share necessary to meet the needs of the poor. And one could imagine that say, UNDP and the World Bank could be charged to achieve that, that balance of global wealth and eliminate poverty through the various mechanisms that we required to bring this all back into balance. We have enough wealth in the world to do this. It's simply we have no mechanism to redistribute it. So in fact, we can eliminate poverty, which has been a goal for you know, decades and decades without much success. Similarly, we could have a set of food accounting. Food is a kind of capital necessary for human well-being. Our goal would be universally adequate human remission, everybody having enough to meet, eat. Food insecurity is linked to poverty, to crop failures, to rising food prices. So it would respond to a number of challenges <clears throat> in our society. <clears throat> and therefore accounting for food production, distribution, consumption and waste, and how to meet medicinal needs would be all part of that food accounting system. We need a comprehensive assessment of food production. How much is the planet able to produce? And is it enough to meet all of our needs? Because we have an increasing population, we have soil degradation, increasing water shortages, the problems of overfishing, 
but to identify what are the limits of planetary food production and what do we need to do to ensure that we're always going to have enough food <coughs> to meet everybody's needs. <coughs> this paper that says one of the big challenges of decades ahead. We need to integrate measures of efficiency, like how efficient is producing meat versus a vegetarian diet, looking at the impacts of climate change as part of looking at food accounting going towards the future. <coughs> and those food accounts would provide a basis for controls or taxes on unsustainable production, on commercial foods of low nutrition, and to support regeneration of food production, guaranteeing a decent income for subsistence in commercial farming and fishing, which is often a problem today because all the profits are captured by middlemen as part of the commercial system of, of, you know, of the consumer-driven you know, food system. FAO could be responsible for the food accounts but making sure there was enough for everybody with sustainable methods and nobody was going hungry. Looking at health accounting, another fundamental area that sort of come to the surface with the pandemic, you know, human health and productivity are part of our, our human capital and activities that damage health are increasing, you might say, a health debt. We presently measure only the financial costs of health care, not the loss of human well-being that comes from bad health. In fact, even things like tobacco and narcotic drugs generate enormous profits because we ignore the health impact that they have. And even pollution and climate change have an impact on health and need to be integrated in looking at health accounting. We have existing health statistics about a certain basis, but we need more on accounting for good health and improved life expectancy, which would be part of that health capital. We also need a multicultural perspective on good health beyond just the Western curative approach of the sort of absence of disease by various curative techniques. The World Health Organization would be responsible for health capital accounting of all of humanity. And it would also be responsible for identifying global risks to health like pandemics and addressing them in the common interest, which is as a start, but is far from what is necessary to really achieve the proper global human health. Looking at work and employment accounting. Similarly, every human being has a capacity to contribute productively to society and should receive the education and opportunity to use that capacity in some meaningful employment. And work even has a social function for human dignity, to be of service, to develop higher moral and spiritual qualities through work and be of service to others. So work would need to include the social services and housekeeping and raising children, such as the food production, there are many things that aren't counted as proper of employment because they're not part of what's seen as the economy and therefore they escape from kind of what they didn't all need to be included in this broader view of, you know, of, of work as, as human capital. So the capital stock, we maximizing every person's productive potential throughout their life, which changes of course throughout their life. We need employment accounting systems for all the contributions for all genders, for all ages and capacities. And of course, unemployment is debt, reducing the capital to generate further wealth, marginalizing parts of the population due to gender, ethnicity, handicap, or other biases are also you know, parts of, of the negative side of this equation. So we need indicators of both the positive and negative incentives to develop the incentives for a more inclusive society. The ILO could provide the accounting for human capacity to generate wealth and well being ensuring that every person has some useful skill and the means to earn a living through meaningful service. Then, of course, things like knowledge and education also need their accounts, even if they're intangible. Uh, we have knowledge, science, art, and culture that are a very important part of human society. But unlike other kinds of capital, they increase in value the more they're shared. A book on a shelf doesn't really do anything until somebody reads it. When they read it, they're enriched by it in some way. So it's a, it, we have to deal with this kind of capital in a different way. Yet our materialistic society has turned much of this capital into intellectual property, which is sold to those who can afford it. And I'm a scientist, but I can't even read many of my own scientific papers because they're, they're under copyright by scientific journals and you have to pay to read them. This prevents many people in the world from accessing these things that ought to be available to everybody. And of course, we, 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 this creates knowledge debt relative to the benefits of open access to all of this knowledge and culture and, and beauty. This form of wealth and capital also needs to be transmitted through education each generation. 
<laughs> the wealth that you accumulate as an individual in that, this kind will vanish when you finally die. And therefore, it's you know, to, to make sure that it's continuing capital, it has to be transmitted in some way to future generations. So we need accounts for both the standing stock and the preservation of knowledge and culture, and the dynamics of access to knowledge, the use of that knowledge, creation of new knowledge, its storage and transmission to generations. So it's a broader kind of accounting that is needed for this intangible area of, of the accounts. Uh, and of course, you have to do that at multiple levels, the global level, national level, and even within families, how well is the family transmitting its own knowledge and, and wealth and, and traditions and so on from generation to generation. We have educational statistics, some knowledge inventories, the probably elements of big data could be used here. And UNESCO would be charged with accounting for this kind of global capital because they already cover art and science and culture in, in their mandate. And then, as I mentioned, there's the area of spiritual accounting. I didn't dare to begin with propose this simply because I thought that's perhaps going too far. I didn't know how one might take the spiritual side of our human nature and come over accounts, but with the work that's now being done on spiritual capital, we have people here present in, our, in this webinar who are working on that, we may be able to find ways forward with similar accounts to apply the same principle in this area of spiritual capital, which is really, you might say, the, the ultimate fruit of human civilization, of human society. So all of this could lead us to a new definition of wealth, putting together all the forms of capital combined into a different way with their complementary currencies, and this would no longer be manipulated in the national interests of states. It's founded on scientific standards of human and natural well being, so it has an objective foundation. But you can adjust the weighting between these depending on priorities. At the moment, climate change is a real crisis, so you give it a higher priority in the accounting. Uh, with a pandemic, health also has to come up for a time being. And this could be adjusted over time as part of global governance to say, how do we weight the different kinds of wealth in terms of what the to society needs at any particular point in time. Of course, the money returns simply be a currency of exchange, a means which is between not an, not an end in itself. Ultimately, we'd have a single global currency to provide that means of exchange. We still would need wages in terms of the work that you do, profits for efficiency, moderate interest on, uh, on you know, loans and capital. But we reduce the financial system to simply one supporting part of something that has a set of more fundamental goals in terms of human and natural well-being. With new measures of total wealth, balancing the various inputs to the, the desirable things that are going forward and the outputs that need to be controlled and brought back to make certain that all these things are brought into the proper balance. We, the institutions wouldn't manage everything. We still have national autonomy and subsidiarity because many things are better done at a lower level, closer to decision-making but we're also able to account for the global common interest and motivating human well-being at the global level. And this will allow us to replace the present financial system. Obviously, it's going to resist these kind of changes. It doesn't want to change. It's fought very well for several decades. But by providing an alternative, we already have a step towards a way forward, showing something that actually will be better responding to human needs and allowing us to create a more just, equitable, and sustainable world society in harmony with nature. So thank you for listening to my summary of what I've tried to do to simulate our going forward. And I, I hope now that we can go beyond this, that you've picked some area that really interests you as an area you'd like to explore and that we can go on. I'll answer any questions you may have to begin with. Great, thank you so much, Arthur. The questions that we've got so far. So I'll, um, Arthur, the, uh, regarding the carbon accounts, what will be the currency? tons of carbon dioxide or an equivalent mon monetary cost to sequester or clean up? I think we need to be looking at, you might say carbon in its elemental form, in the sense that you have carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, you have methane, uh, when the carbon is stored in the ground, is stored in, in various organic forms or even in, in inorganic forms or so on and so forth. So to be more comprehensive, you really look at, 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 at carbon and therefore, you, you know, the weight of carbon as it's represented in the various compounds of which it, it, it forms a part. Because uh, that gives you more flexibility at how the carbon is stored in the different parts of the system. I think, we, I think at, at this point, we first need to get the accounts balanced in the whole cycle. And then we say, where are the elements where 
they're either generating weight costs or, or benefits that you could then tax it with some kind of financial element of exchange to, but, but I think if we go too early to put things in, in monetary terms, then uh, uh, we're, we limit ourselves too much in terms of how we, how we achieve the balance of the accounting. Arthur, it may well be that uh, your answers to questions generate further chat questions down the line, but the next one for you to address, please, is uh, you <clears throat> made an assertion in your presentation, which was excellent, uh, that there's enough wealth to go around the planet. Uh, the question is, what mechanism or system do you recommend to redress the imbalance? You know, at the national level, we use a system of taxation and generally a graduated system of taxation where you know, the wealthy obviously can contribute more. We have, in fact, you know, in, in the Baha'i framework, there are references to the need for you know, a graduated system of taxation where people whose revenues meet just enough to meet their needs pay no tax. People who, uh, you know, a farmer who has a failed crop or so on receives what he needs to have a negative income tax to make up what he needs. Uh, and then it goes up to a, you know, a fifty percent for people who have a very larger large income relative to their needs pay up to half of their ex additional income in tax. Uh, and, but you also have a wealth tax for an accumulation of capital beyond your needs is also subject to a wealth tax. So there, there, or even even the Baha'i concept, there are a set of principles for elements of taxation that would allow the generation of the wealth to respond to those needs, including you know that the idea of negative tax for those who need it. So it says. It, I think that gives us a, a basis of certain principles that would need to be extended. And of course, clearly that also means going beyond a purely national approach because nationalism of taxation, but in a globalized economy, the wealthy in particular have very, find it very easy to put their wealth in tax-free havens or to hide it in, in corporate structures where you, the, the owners are hidden behind them and so on. There are all sorts of ways in which they've tried to escape from sharing their wealth. And so those would also need to be taken into account in some way and compensated for. Uh, so I think that would give us the, the set of principles, but it clearly means that we need to go either to a, a global system of taxation or a harmonized system of national taxes, which are more uniform around the world to make certain people aren't escaping from them by just moving from one place to another. The next question is, what is the next step? How do we operationalize these sound principles into a spreadsheet for 193 countries accounting for global GDP? Well, as I mentioned, uh, there's, there's not one single measure. I think there, there's not one single measure of well-being, of human well-being, of what should be the goals of our society. And therefore, you know, I've suggested that it was spread, you might say an initial spread across several, you know, the environmental, social, and economic dimensions uh, as a way of getting started in this process. One could imagine it become much more elaborate later on. But I think the first step is simply for each of these potential kinds of, of capital economy measure or, or a social or environmental goal that we should first say, how do we operationalize the accounting system for that particular measure? Who has already the data that is needed? Are there gaps in the data? I mentioned that we've got pretty good data on, on poverty, not nearly good enough data on wealth. And therefore, how will we collect the additional data that is needed? And, and then once you have the data to, to design the system, uh, then you can all, already begin to show what that account system would, would demonstrate in terms of where we're going the right direction or the wrong direction. That then makes it possible to begin to make the political decisions. You know, how would we use the accounting system to actually begin to rebalance in terms of extracting wealth where there's too much wealth and delivering it where it is needed, which means going to a whole governance implementation process. Uh, and that it's still, I think, in early days to imagine how that would happen. So um, my suggestion is simply, let's already start to build the different elements of the accounting system and showing how it gives it much better drivers for what we all think is the direction society should be going in. And on that basis, we could then say, well, how do we build the governance mechanisms to put this into practice? Thank you, Arthur. Could you next please share your thoughts on the ability of a carbon pricing or carbon tax system to deliver the 2030 carbon dioxide reduction goals? Well, I think there's, I think there's wide recognition that a carbon tax is going to be 
the, the most more efficient way of trying to, to address this excess flow of fossil carbon into the atmosphere. Now there are several problems that looked at after you look at the media already, already when they tried it in France, they didn't look at the social impacts and the fact that this carbon tax hurt the most the poor rural populations who had no choice in, cha in forms of transportation and simply saw this as, as making their life impossible. And so there, therefore, it, you cannot simply have a, a blanket thing like a carbon tax without also looking at its social impacts and what other compensation mechanisms are needed to make it work you know, in the immediate or short term. One also has to look at the fact that we don't yet have a system of global taxation. Well, in fact, there is one. Nobody wants to admit it, but there is a global tax on shipping in the funding mechanism for the International Maritime Organization, which charges a fee for the flag registration of every ship, which is a kind of a global tax on shipping to pay for the function of that United Nations organization. But nobody wants to admit the idea of global taxes because that's part of national sovereignty that only nations can charge taxes. So it may take some time to you know, break through that, that area and get, and, but maybe we can do it on climate change and, and make, get a first step forward uh, to, to you know, if we can get the governments to agree to do it. So I think one, one, we have the science tell us what is a reasonable level of a carbon tax to achieve some immediate impact. Second one would be, how do we compensate for those who are hit the most by it, who can't afford to pay it, and to make sure that it's really being paid for by those who are responsible. Now, whether in fact, one should be aiming at taxing the people extracting the carbon from the ground, as opposed to those who are then using the fossil fuel later on. I mean, the, those companies have been trying carefully to avoid any responsibility because they want it to be passed on to the consumer. So there's a certain number of debates there as to where is the best place to apply the tax to in order to achieve the goals that need to be achieved. So I mean, it's not a perfect answer, but those are the set of issues that have to be addressed even in the short term to start with carbon taxation. But at the same time, we also should be saying the money collected should be going one to achieve you know, the social balancing where it's hurting the poor people the most, and then also be paying for the, the, the carbon mitigation and the carbon adaptation to climate change and to be redeveloping the carbon sinks that were necessary to achieve the long-term goals. So we also, the positive side was not just the negative side of taxation, but also the positive benefits that can come from the flow of, of resources in the right direction. The next question we have is how do we convince rich countries and the wealthy to take this seriously as they will feel the losers in this change? It's easy to be a loser when you consider that you have the right to accumulate all of the wealth on the planet or become the richest nation and therefore the most powerful and you're, you're driven by the ego and, and so on and so forth. You know, the definitions of, of success have created you know, very much that image, which of course is where we need perhaps a much more fundamental transformation, almost at a spiritual level, to acknowledge that you know, the well-being of an individual is also dependent on the well-being of the whole. And that you know, is it is it is it moral at all that some people can get extremely rich while half the world's population can hardly make ends meet you know, or feed their children. And I think that's where you know, this, these extremes have developed because there is no mo sense of moral responsibility. And until we can strengthen that, there will always be those who, because they're the rich and powerful, will defend their interests. And in fact, in the past, too often has taken violent revolution to finally overthrow such people in power, and hopefully we can find a better way of doing it in the future. It's not an easy answer, but that's the reality that we're facing. They're the last ones who want to change. But even if we can get a majority of countries say, this is where we have to go, and over into it there, we can gradually marginalize those, those who are trying to escape from that responsibility and free riding on it, and ultimately you know, create a point where they feel obliged to come and join you know, the majority. Arthur, the next one is uh, how would you address issues that cut across each other? For example, uh, discrimination that arises in numerous areas. Well, you know, as clearly, all of these processes need to be inclusive. You, know, you can't do a partial accounting. Uh, that, you know, much of the accounting present now is only basically of, of the wealthy for the wealthy. We account for people in paid employment 
We don't account for people at subsistence level, for the poor struggling to make an end meet in the informal economy and so on. So we already have extremely biased systems of accounting. And with any kind of justice in the world, the accounts have to be expanded to, to leave no one behind. And again, the governments have taken that as a goal, eliminating poverty, leaving no one behind. It's been accepted as a legitimate goal, but it's not been implemented because of the resistance of the vested interests who don't want to give up their advantages. So, you know, and so we, the goal is there, uh, but, it, and I think that's what, if some, some countries are doing better than others, I think the more some nations are ready to, to like, show that it's possible and show that they can achieve much more stable and livable societies because they've eliminated the extremes of wealth and poverty, because they, 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 they've ensured there's justice for everyone, and that, that is a desirable state of affairs that will benefit the wealthy as well in the future. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, so who will collect the data in each area to create the baseline from which the progress can be measured? This is why I suggested in many areas, we already have United Nations organization, which is charged with that domain. Right? You know, if we look at food accounts, the Food Agriculture Organization already collects <clears throat> food statistics. It may be they would need to add some confidence on the nutrition side of things, uh, you know, on the, the, the food consumption side of things, uh, in order to, to complete that picture of the whole food cycle. And but there may be like, other parts of the system or other competencies in the world, that are, whether they're in non governmental organizations or in intergovernmental organizations, you know, looking at that, it may be part of what UNESCO or W does in science and what you know, WJ does with us in health that could be shared across with them to complete you know, that element of the food accounts. In the same way for knowledge and science and culture and art, UNESCO already has a mandate in the area. They may not do much on statistics, but they could build on that to become responsible for the statistics along with the scientific community and cultural bodies that they work with and so on. <clears throat> so as, as I said, there are a whole series of organizations you know, UNEP already has competences in the pollution area with the various conventions it's responsible for and so on. So from, from many of what I've suggested, oh, we don't yet have a spiritual agency to handle spiritual capital accounts. And that's where I went to leave it to Alain and, and his group to, to come up with an institutional framework for that. But I think you know, from, from many parts of this, there already are components of the system. We're not starting from scratch. We can build what we already have and take it forward from there. Arthur, again, it's another segue. You, you get these coming from all directions. Uh, this is one. This is one about justice. So, how would you ensure that justice is maintained in uh, within the governing authorities who have to implement all these programs, so that trust is assured? Well, this is the fundamental challenge of governance in general. You know, governments that have earned trust, you know, are able to collect taxes, are able to deliver services, and so on, because they see their role as a government is to be of service to the population. And many constitutions and charters provide some kind of goal of that sort as the foundation you know, for governance. And clearly, unfortunately today, more and more we see that the institutions are, of society are being turned away from that sense of serving the common good to serve particular interests. And therefore, you know, they, they ultimately lose the trust because they're, not, they're, they're seen to be benefiting you know, special groups and not, not the whole. So I think this is part of the challenge of designing the institutions for today and tomorrow is to make certain that they earn the trust. And partly, I think, part of that would come from the fact that I suggested to the extent that the systems are made based on sound science, objective measures, that everybody sees that's the measure, the true situation, that takes a certain subjectivity out of it. And therefore, people have more confidence that like, you know, this is good science. And we have, we've already seen you know, the institutions for say climate change science and so on that have earned a certain level of trust because all the governments are involved, you know, there's, there's, there's a wide level of participation, you know, it's done openly and so on and so forth. So there are tools for building trust and there are ways that can be done, but it, it means designing institutions with that purpose in mind and transparently gradually earning the trust to go forward. We saw that with the European Union, it started as a coal and steel community. Once they built trust between, you know, France and Germany have just been at war, that they could actually cooperate in sharing coal and steel. Then they were able to build a bit more trust and take a step forward and gradually build institutions into the European Union of today. So in the same way, we can build institutions to go forward 
earning the trust of society, drawing on science, being transparent, and showing they're considering the needs of all in the process. Excellent. Thank you so much. I know we have more questions and we've got lots of ideas and comments and we're going to we're capturing everything that's in the chat. We'll be sharing all of this information after this session. Thank you very, very much for showing up today. And I hope this is the beginning of a really rich and ongoing conversation on how do we measure well-being in our accounting. Mm -hmm.